the Commodities Market Bubble, Money Manager Capitalism and the Financialization of Commodities by L. Randall Ray. Manipulation of Supplies and Prices In recent years, there have been several well-publicized cases of commodity price manipulation. For example, in winter 2004, British Petroleum monopolized 90% of all TET propane supplies, propane transported via the East Texas Pipeline System, the primary means by which deliveries are made to the Northeast and Midwest, and withheld enough from the market to drive prices up. In 2007, it reached a court settlement, agreeing to pay $303 million in penalties and restitution. Amaranth manipulated natural gas spot prices by driving down futures contract prices in the last 30 minutes of trading for the, Mar for the March, April, and May 2006 contracts. It made profits by shorting positions in the Intercontinental Exchange ICE, market before collapsing in September 2006. Other well-known cases include the Hunt Brothers' manipulation of silver prices, Mark Rich and Manny Weiss's squeeze on aluminum, the Sumitomo copper affair, and Tiger Management's adjustment of the, paladin, of the palladium market. More recently, on July 22nd, Sem Group filed for bankruptcy after it suffered $3.2 billion law in losses on oil futures and derivatives, allegedly due to unauthorized speculation by its co-founder and former CEO. It is not clear at this point whether the speculation consisted of outright manipulation or was simply a series of ill-advised bets. In any case, there is little doubt that manipulation played some role in the commodity's price rise, at least for some commodities. Acting Chair Walter L. Lucan was, has argued the primary mission of the CFTS is, quote, detecting and rooting out illegal and intentional manipulation of the markets, end quote. After crude oil prices exploded, the CFTC put together a nationwide crude oil investigation that culminated in charges levied in July 2008 against Opti Optiver for price manipulation backed in March 2007. The CFTC found that its traders had successfully moved prices by small amounts to their benefit. Since 2002, the CFTC has ch filed 42 enforce enforcement actions charging 72 defendants with manipulation. In addition, the Department of Justice has filed more than 47 criminal complaints. Still, in an interim report issued July 22, 2008, the CFTC concluded that, although there were these isolated instances of manipulation, quote, rising oil prices are largely due to fundamental supply and demand factors, end quote. This is not altogether comforting, giving the CFTC's bias against intervention, as we will see. In the next section, I will discuss the possibility that financial markets have driven prices higher through the use of index funds that allocate a portion of assets to commodities. It is interesting that the CFTC not only rejects this interpretation, but also implicitly denies that such activity is within its core mission, which is narrowly construed to detect the illegal and intentional manipulation of prices. This statement even seems to reject CFTC responsibility for, re for regulating legal speculation, something that was clearly part of its original mission. One might argue that the CFTC misses the forest for the trees as it focuses on individual traders who illegally move prices by a few basis points to make small profits, while pension funds and hedge funds might be increasing prices fivefold through legal buy-and-hold strategies. In other words, by limiting its concern to illegal manipulation, the CFTC ignores the much larger impacts on prices that result from speculative inflows of managed money. Indeed, it is difficult to avoid the conclusion 
that the CFTC bears some responsibility for encouraging the massive flow of managed money into the commodity futures market in the first place when it actively promoted the notion that commodity futures should be seen as an asset class. Even as late as December 19th, 2007, that is, long after it, it was obvious that a commodity price boom was underway, the CFTC released a study purporting to show that the returns on benchmark commodities remained uncorrelated with returns on equity investments. Thus, quote, commodity markets seem to have retained their role as a portfolio diversification tool, end quote. In the next section, we will show how this contrasts with the well-accepted understanding of the primary role that commodity future markets should play. However, diversification provides the main justification for managed flows into commodity markets. Rather than showing concern, the CFTC was encouraging even greater flows. In addition, the Commission has steadfastly denied that the flow of managed money impacted commodity prices. For example, in its interim report issued last July, the CFTC clung to the argument that fundamentals remain the principal cause of rising prices. Only after determined prodding by elected representatives in Washington did CFTC officials admit that their conclusions were not justified by their analyses, promising to collect more data before releasing their final report, which was issued on September 11th. Footnote 3. In, this, in its final report, the CFTC recommends preliminary actions to increase transparency and improve controls in the marketplace, along with the creation of a new swap dealer classification for reporting purposes. Lucan states that the new recommendations represent steps in modernizing the agency's approach to oversight while ensuring that the markets remain competitive, open, and on U.S. soil. However, the report also states that while there was an increase in the net notional value of commodity index business in crude oil futures, it appears to be due to an appreciation of the value of existing investments caused by the rise in crude oil prices and not the result of more money flowing into commodity index trading. End quote. The Inspector General for the CFTC recently began an investigation to determine whether the CFTC's intern report had intentionally misled Congress in order to help defeat anti-speculation legislation. Footnote 4. As discussed below, concerns that the CFTC was intentionally misleading Congress were heightened when it became known that the Commission had reclassified one very large trader as non-commercial a category comprising speculators, just before it released its interim report in July. The reclassification had been withheld from the report and from testimony presented to Congress, even though it tipped the balance towards speculator dominance of futures markets. End footnote. These actions seem to have followed a long-term hands-off approach to commodity markets by the executive branch. When the House considered legislation that would direct the CFTC to set and administer position limits across a range of commodity futures, the Bush administration signaled that it strongly opposed the bill and that the President would veto it. The CFTC has instituted position limits in the past, but it has also authorized a loophole that beginning in 1991 allows exemptions for swap dealers. Footnote number five. Most, insti most institutional investors that want to take positions in commodities go through Wall Street banks that arrange over-the-counter commodity index swaps. End footnote. Similarly, the New York Mercantile Exchange, NYMEX, has granted a large number of exceptions from, positions limit, from position limits, the majority of which were for speculative rather than hedging purposes. Just as the Fed under Greenspan's leadership refused to impose margin limits during the Nasdaq boom, the CFTC has failed to exercise its mandate to constrain leverage positions in commodity futures. Those familiar with the 1980s savings and loan fiasco will recall a similar hands-off treatment by many regulators, 
who saw their role as something akin to cheerleading, best represented by William Ziedman, who, while chairman of the Federal Deposit Insurance Cor Corporation, announced to his staff, quote, bankers are our friends. The FDIC should be a friend of the industry, end quote, like a trade association for the industry. Cheerleaders do not make good regulators. Unfortunately, at least some of the CFTC's actions appear to border on just this sort of boosterism. Footnote 6. Interestingly, Gregory Mosek, who had been Director of Enforcement at the CFTC since 2002, left the agency in early July to join the law firm of McDermott, Will & Emery, which represents the International Swaps and Deriv Derivatives Association on federal anti-manipulation efforts. Students of the 1980s savings and loan crisis will recall a similar revolving door in which regulators were offered lucrative positions in those institutions they were supposed to oversee. It was reported that Mosek's new firm said he, quote, would be invaluable in helping their clients fend off government aid energy manipulation investigations, an area that Mosek helped pioneer at the CFTC, end quote. Apparently, Mosek had been a feared enforcement officer, helping to lead cases against Enron, Amaranth, Dyingy, and other large energy companies. Perhaps energy price manipulators can sleep better now. End footnote. As an example, so-called black pools were first encouraged in 1993 by Wendy Lee Graham, then chair of the CFTC, who exempted from regulation customized energy derivatives that did not trade on registered exchanges. Congress extended this in 2000's Commodity Futures Moderniza Modernization Act by including the Enron loophole so that unregulated over-the-counter electronic exchanges would not be required to keep records or to file reports with the CFTC. The Enron fiasco that resulted did not deter the CFTC from granting further exemptions from oversight. In January 2006, the Commission allowed ICE, the leader in electronic energy exchanges, to provide trading terminals in the United States for the trading of U.S. oil futures on the ICE Futures Exchange in London, promoting an escape route around the CFTC-regulated re NYMEX. Thus, U.S. traders using terminals in the United States to trade U.S. commodity futures were exempt from U.S. regulatory e oversight. ICE accounts for more than a third of trading, on average, and total unregulated over-the-counter commodity trades are now estimated at $9 trillion versus $5 trillion on regulated exchanges. Hence, the CFTC actually encouraged development of a largely unregulated competitor to the lightly regulated U.S. exchanges. In any case, the CFTC is woefully understaffed, raising questions about its ability to oversee even the regulated part of the market. As of last year, it had only 437 employees, 12% fewer than it had in 1976. While the size of the market it supervisors has grown more, more than a thousandfold over that span. Although in recent months the CFTC has indicated greater interest in expanding its reach, indeed the Commission has lately gained some authority over formerly exempt commercial markets, such as ICE. Its chief enforcement officer at the time, Gregory Mosek, worried that extending surveillance to the huge swap market would cost too much. Footnote 7. Stephen J. Obi, regional counsel for the agency's New York office, was named acting director of the division. End, end footnote. Until Congress and the President are willing to al allocate a much larger budget to the CFTC, it is unlikely that oversight will significantly improve. The point of all of this is, so long as the term manipulation is limited to the actions of individual traders, 
it cannot play a significant role in the current commodities price boom, since the most important markets, oil, soybeans, corn, wheat, are too big to be influenced for anything but the shortest time period. There are stories of oil tankers sent on roundabout routes to try to keep oil off the market for days. There are a handful of rogue traders who try to move prices for a few minutes in order to complete trades. There might be a conspiracy to time maintenance shutdowns at oil refineries around the world, thereby constraining production. Still, the oil market is too big and there are too many players and too much incentive to take advantage of current high prices for narrowly defined manipulation to explain the historic run-up of crude oil prices over the past few years. In the case of agricultural commodities, like corn, like corn and soybeans, markets are again too big to be manipulable across growing seasons. However, as Veneroso has argued, metals markets are small, and we know they have been manipulated in the past. So it is far more plausible that narrowly defined manipulation has affected prices of the smaller commodity markets. Note also how the manipulation of supplies complements the supply and demand story from the previous section. So, in conclusion, the manipulation of commodity markets by a few handfuls of suppliers and intermediaries probably goes some way toward explaining the temporary price increases in at least a portion of the commodities market, but it is not likely to explain the broad-based commodities boom over the extended run-up in prices that has been taking place for several years. What is potentially far more important is the impact of large pools of managed money following similar strategies, without any necessity for explicit collusion. In the case of the subprime boom, we now know that the underlying mortgages were packed into securities, blessed by ratings agencies, and marketed by Wall Street using s similar statistical methods to assess risk. Regulators and supervisors responsible for protecting homeowners, financial institutions, and pension funds turned a blind eye to the systemic risk created, and in notable cases even led the cheers for the new instruments and practices. Recall that Greenspan promoted the highly toxic option ARMS for subprime borrowers. It appears that the CFTC is now doing the same, focusing on individual price manipulators while ignoring its congressional mandate to ensure that commodity prices reflect the laws of supply and demand. The U.S. Commodity Exchange Act states, quote, excessive speculation in any commodity under contracts of sale of such commodity for future delivery, causing sudden or unreasonable fluctuations or unwarranted changes in the price of such commodity is an undue and unnecessary burden on interstate commerce in such commodity, end quote, and directs the CFTC to establish trading limits, quote, as the commission finds are necessary to diminish, eliminate, and prevent such burden, end quote. Unfortunately, the CFTC has instead allowed and even encouraged expansion of the proportion. It, unfortunately, the CFTC has instead allowed and even encouraged expansion of the portion of the market that is unregulated, the black pools of future of futures trading that are hidden from view, as it trains its sights on illegal manipulation. As I will discuss in the next section. It is possible that commodity prices have been pushed by massive inflows of managed money following a buy-and-hold strategy that is self-reinforcing precisely because it will be successful so long as the flows are large enough. This could have been curtailed if the CFTC had assumed a broader mandate.